Borada. I was told you'd be impressed if I could say that, but you'll be less impressed when you understand that I've actually written it down on my pad. Um, welcome. Thank you to uh, Joe and Chris for having me back. So I must have done something right the first time around. Um, so the way, the form, the way this uh, session will run is I'll talk for about 45 minutes. Then I'll hand over to you for some table talk because my talk is a talk with a task. And I'll give you the task that I'd like you to focus on uh, partway into the presentation. So there is kind of a, a purpose in this. And hopefully by the end of the talk, we'll, we'll leave with some, uh, some ideas that we've created in, in this space. Um, we'll feed back from each of the tables at the end and collate things together. Uh, nothing else to say really apart from uh, I'm going to stand on the stage for the first 30 seconds and then I'm going to invade your space and come down into you because uh, the first thing I'd like to open up the discussion with is this, uh, this concept of leadership that talks about hubristic leadership but I guess we need to uh, have a clear idea about what we mean by leadership. So... Uh, one of the tactics I've learned to use in giving these talks is to prod and poke the audience with questions. So uh, with my students, I call them stay awake questions. It's too early in the day for, for it to be stay awake. So it's kind of a, to get you engaged. So in terms of leadership, uh, just quick fire. We don't need roving microphones or anything like that. If you've got a response, please feel free to uh, project it forward. Oh, by the way, I should have said this. Um, any PowerPoints that you've got in advance, please ignore because I did some last minute changes, which are kind of 90% of the PowerPoint. So ignore <laughs> anything that you've been given. Also, which I'm slightly worried about, if you look at the PowerPoint, you'll know the answers to the questions. So ignore them if you have them. I don't know if you have. Right, leadership. So um, kind of word association or quick fire. What word springs to mind when you see Followers. the word leadership? Followers. Thank you. I didn't plant that question, but it was a superb quick response, whoever did it. Followers, so followers are involved in the leadership process. What else? Other so adjectives that kind of uh, spring to mind. Call out, bail me out, help me out. Vision. vision. Followers, vision. Direction. 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 Values. Values. Strategy. 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 Decision making. Decision -making. Yep. Inspirational. Right, we'll stop. We've got five. My hand was going higher and higher every time, wasn't it? So when you do this exercise with managers, exec students, you get words like that. Uh, responsible, vision, strategy, inspiration, motivation. You name it, uh, whatever positive word you want to uh, come up with springs to mind. Um, now, what you don't get is the dark side. And you never get words when you do that exercise with a group like those, like offensive, tyrannical, intimidating, narcissistic, hubristic, and so on and so forth. So the reason for the, uh, the dark side of the moon there is leadership is a bit like the moon. It's got a dark side. And we, try, we tend to overlook the dark side Rightly so, to some extent, in favour of viewing its positive attributes. But the way that I'm positioning this concept of hubristic leadership is as a type of destru destructive leadership. Now, there are, there's a whole kind of catalogue of destructive leaderships in the same way that there's a whole catalogue of uh, constructive leaderships like charismatic, etc., etc. Uh, social undermining, so destructive leadership, social undermining, abusive supervision, etc., etc. And hubris is, I think it's one of those. Uh, and the title of the talk was to do with hazard, hubristic leadership as a hazard for organisations, and also about managing the risks of that hazard. So it's really all about trying to, this talk is about trying to find out what hubristic leadership is, what causes it? What are its consequences? But most importantly, I guess, in going forward is what we can do to avoid it from happening. Um, so that's by way of introduction. Um, 
by way of the task. So here's your heads up on the task. So kind of in terms of your motivation and direction and engagement with this talk, it's a, it's a talk with a task, all right? And the talk is me, but you'll be doing table talk later for 15 minutes with your facilitators, and then you'll be feeding back to the big group. And that's the task. What skills do managers in your organisation need to combat the hubris hazard? Now, I'll say a little bit more about the task as we get closer to it. But that's your heads up. That's your kind of advanced organiser for where the talk is headed. OK, it'll come back later, so don't worry if you didn't manage to scribble it down. Right, uh, or oh, another piece of context which might be useful for you is that um, at the winter school, I did a talk on the same subject, <clears throat> different format, different content, uh, uh, to senior leaders, execs and board members and so on and so forth. So uh, the group near the top of that pyramid know all about hubris and the hazard and the risks. Uh, uh, and now it's kind of, I suppose it's a bit of a cascade now at the summer school to the level down below those seen, that very senior level. And in a way, I think you're in an interesting position because you all, you're almost in that uh, overlap between the very senior levels and the levels lower down the organisation. And I think managers at your level have a particularly important and crucial, vital, whatever other word you want to throw in, role to play in containing and combating hubris at the top. That's not to say, of course, we ourselves, me included, aren't prone to hubris. All right, so that's by way of context. So what is it? Uh, and I now know what it is in Welsh. Thank you very much. Uh, I won't attempt to pronounce it in Welsh. So what is it? It's a word we kind of bandy around. It's been in the papers a lot recently with uh, political issues and so on and so forth. But what is it? Uh, the best way to understand it is with Greek mythology. And this is the famous uh, myth of uh, Daedalus, who was the master craftsman uh, on the left there, and Icarus, his son, and they were imprisoned on a Greek island by King Minos, and they uh, wanted to escape. So the master craftsman Daedalus fashioned wings out of wax and feathers, which gave them the power, underline that phrase, of flight, which was a godlike power uh, and not something that mortals should have. These are all clues about what hubris is really about. Uh, and poor old Icarus got too confident, too overambitious, too reckless in his behaviour, flew too close to the sun and crashed to earth and died. His father Daedalus ex uh, encouraged him strongly not to fly too high, and we know that bit of the story, but if you read it in detail, he also said, don't fly too low. And you've got a book out there on the stand called Managing Risk, and I think it's, he didn't manage the risk properly. Anyway, so that's hubris. If you've understood that story, and you did before you came in here, then you understand what hubris is. Uh, it's intoxication with power. So his, his, his intoxication, Icarus's intoxication, was with the power of flight. Um, was with the power of flight. So he, he became too confident, too hubristic um, for his own good. So then transfer the metaphor, the analogy, the myth across to organisational settings. And I think it works pretty well uh, as a beautiful exemplar of what this hazard is like. So intoxication with power, so that's it. Hubristic leaders, hubrists, we can call them, are intoxicated by power and success. So De Icarus was intoxicated by his success as well as his power. He soared higher and higher until he went too close to the sun and he was prone to recklessness. All right. So it's intoxication with power. Right, um, I'm going to use political examples. And the reason, one of the reasons I'm going to use political examples to some extent in the talk is because they provide us with a wonderful caricature, an exaggeration of what hubristic leadership is like. 
So I'll use a couple of those in particular, the one on the left and the one on the right, to illustrate it. So think of them as caricatures to help us to get our head around what hubris is. So this isn't about politics. We're using them as caricatures, exaggerations, in the way that those images are exaggerations of each of the respective leaders. So, um, if we take the third one, the 45th President of the United States. Now, again, I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, throw in some words that... Uh, Polite adjectives uh, that would describe the 45th president's uh, leadership style. Over to you. What? Well, sir? Say again. Vain. Good. Thank you. Vain. Controversial. Cavalier. Spoilt. Arrogant. Childlike. Disruptor, which is not a bad thing necessarily, is it? You know, maybe we need these mavericks who disrupt things now and again. Any more polite object adjectives? Impulsive, Impulsive. Impulsive. self-serving. We could go on. Popular. Now, his popular, popular, fantastic response. <laughs> His popularity rating is as high now as it has ever been. Discuss. Well, we won't, but, you know. Uh, but it's a great point, isn't it? It is a fantastic point. So here are some that I prepared earlier. Overconfident, overambitious, contemptuous, arrogant, uh, displaying hubristic pride. Pride is a good thing, isn't it? Authentic pride is a good thing. But hubristic pride is not a good thing. Uh, hubristic pride is pride in oneself. It's kind of overweening pride. It's a little bit like narcissistic pride. And it's all about you, not you, the person who suffers from it, um, and their achievements and them, etc., etc. And it's about recklessness as well. So reckless behaviour. Uh, so those are those. If you want my definition of hubris, those would be my uh, key adjectives to describe it. Um, hubristic hall of fame. I've not said hubristic hall of shame, but I could have done, I suppose, couldn't I? And the first two, they're from finance, they're from banking and finance. And we think, well, okay, well, this is uh, government, public sector. What's that got to do with us? I'll tell you. I'll show you what it's got to do with you, in a minute. Um, so that's Richard Fold, who was chairman and chief executive of Lehman Brothers, who went down in the financial crisis 2007-2008, and uh, that was a very um, <clears throat> what's the word? A propitious article in the FT in 2008 which talked about his hubris, and that was in the height, the maelstrom of the financial crisis. Well, as it was beginning, really. Uh, hubris is thy name, Richard Fould. So, hubristic leadership of the kind that Richard Fould was uh, guilty of, was part of the financial crisis. Another one closer to home, Fred Goodwin. And I did say Fred, I didn't say Sir Fred, because, of course, what happened was he lost his knighthood in the aftermath of the £46 billion bailout of RBS by us, the taxpayer. OK, so there's kind of a little bit of a clue there about the consequences of their hubristic leadership, um, and it's to do with how it affects us. So, if your money is in an ISA, and you've got an interest rate of 0.1%, then it's a zombie, uh, well, you can partly thank people like uh, those two and everybody else who was complicit in the financial crisis. Because from 2008, right the way through, it's flatlined. We've been on emergency interest rates. Now, one of the important points about hubris, it's a vital point, and these two cases illustrate it, is to do with consequences. So Richard Fold did not set out to be party to a financial crash. Fred Goodwin did not set out 
to be bailed out by the UK taxpayer to the tune of £46 billion and wrecked the bank. Icarus did not set out to crash to his death in the Icarian Sea. Nonetheless, their behaviours, their reckless behaviours, brought about negative, unintended consequences. And that idea of negative, unintended consequences illustrates a conundrum of hubris that I've not really got my head around yet. And it's this idea of it as a rear mirror phenomenon. You, you know it when you look in the rear mirror and see the consequences. But actually, driving along, it's easy to be oblivious to the conditions that a leader or an organisation create that bring those uh, consequences about. And coming back to the idea of risk, in one sense, it's an issue about managing risk and <coughs> recklessness. Public sector examples, so the public sector is not immune. So, Carillion, it's happening now. This was in May, like a couple of months ago, less. Uh, that, was the, that was the opening sentence of the parliamentary report into the Carillion uh, debacle. Its rise and spectacular fall was a story of recklessness, hubris and greed. I've kind of uh, trawled through some of the news stories in recent years. Uh, Times Educational Supplement, you don't need to read the full article, but it's there and it's the idea of uh, the downfall of superheads. This is Heath Monk writing in the Times Educational in 2016. Reminds me of a Greek tragedy. So often their careers end in tears. Why is it a Greek tragedy? Well, it's a, a Greek tragedy because the Greek myths tell us a huge amount about the, the issue of hubris. And we've had Icarus and Daedalus, but this is Achilles. And Achilles was the greatest of the Greek warriors. You know, so almost, not all, well, not single-handedly won the Trojan War, but was instrumental in the winning of the Trojan War. But of course, uh, Achilles has got an Achilles heel. And the point about Achilles, I think, is really an interesting one as far as hubris goes. And it goes to a point that I'll make later, where the source of our strengths, any of us, but leaders in particular, can become the source of our weakness. So the source of Achilles' strength was that he was dipped in the river by his mother uh, to give him the, pa the, the, the powers that he had. But she held him by the heel. So his dipping in the river, being held by the heel to give him those powers, was actually his downfall. Because Achilles died by being shot with an arrow in his heel by Paris, a Trojan. So it's an interesting, the, the Greek myths are immensely rich to understand these perennial ideas. Um, strengths become weaknesses, it's a paradox. Uh, and then medical hubris, this is a quote from Henry Marsh, he's a famous author and brain surgeon. And he says, the, uh, the funny thing about medical hubris, cutting to the chase of, of this quote from The Spectator, is that Nemesis, and Nemesis, the, Nemesis is, is the Greek goddess of retribution. She's the one who comes along and um, visits punishment on mortals who have the temerity to assume godlike powers. Nemesis isn't visited on the surgeon necessarily. In the medical case, it's visited on the patient. So um, it's across politics, it's across business, it's across public and uh, private sectors. Okay, so a little bit of kind of modelling and theory of it. So this is my simple uh, way of understanding it. I like to keep things simple. So there are, there are risk factors and there are consequences. And we've really covered the risk factors already uh, in terms of prior success. So think of Icarus. Prior success, flying high. Power, the power of flight. Over self-evaluation. So Icarus over-evaluated his... Uh, his power of flight, his ability to fly, and became reckless. <coughs> the second risk factor is around the idea of restraint. So removal of restraint or minimal restraint on the leader. 
So the, the kind of the lethal cocktail, I suppose, is the combination of, of personal risk factors about the leader, him or herself, um, and the removal of restraints. Now, I did say they're him or herself, but uh, typically they are hims, males. If you look at the kind of the hubris hall of shame, then there's a preponderance of males. And there might be a biological explanation for that. Because one of the things that gives us confidence is testosterone. And one of the things that males have <coughs> a lot of, especially in their youth, is testosterone. And testosterone fuels confidence. And victory fuels more testosterone, fuels more confidence. And that can lead to kind of a vicious circle of confidence and recklessness spiralling out of control. And it's a young, potentially, it's a young male phenomenon. So if we look at the financial crisis, so the trading desks are populated by young males, largely, and that's a problem with the financial sector. So maybe there's a, uh, a case for rebalancing that particular profession, but maybe leadership more generally with... Uh, females and older males, uh, and then we can kind of uh, manage that testosterone effect. Anyway, that's really an aside. And then the two risk factors combined give us unintended negative consequences. So, in the next 10 minutes or so, what I would like to do is just talk about the risk factors in a bit more detail. I'm going to talk about over-self-evaluation, and then I'm going to talk about restraints on leadership. So, Self-evaluation, first risk factor, over self-evaluation. So, um, positive self-evaluation is, is a good thing. We all need a bit of it, don't we? Uh, a bit of narcissism, actually. Healthy narcissism can be a good thing. If I didn't have positive self-evaluation um, to a degree, I wouldn't think that I could come here and stand in front of 250 people and try to keep them engaged for 45 minutes. So there's a positive self-evaluation there. It helps us to get through uh, the things that we uh, engage with. But it's good up to a point. So I over-prepare uh, to compensate for my, uh, you know, the other aspect of self-evaluation. So we're all taught to say, yeah, we can do. Not that we can't do. Let's brush out the T on can't and let's talk about can. I can do it. And then famous quote about it. If you can dream it, you can do it, Walt Disney. Well, can you? If you dream it, can you do it? I could dream to be the dean of Harvard Business School. But it's not going to happen, is it? Um, so there's a, it's a matter of degree and it's a matter of moderation of ambition and right ambition, and right self-evaluation. So too much of a good thing. What is self-evaluation? So healthy self-evaluation is self-esteem. What's self-esteem? I am worthy. Uh, we're kind of challenged in life, aren't we, if we don't have a degree of self-esteem. However, you can take it to an extreme and say, I am the most worthy. Second one is self-efficacy. Uh, I can succeed at tasks. And we take that to an extreme, we overblow it, and it becomes, I succeed at every task. Locus of control. Events in my world are within my control to an extent. And then you know where this goes. Everything is within my control. And then the third one, fourth one, emotional stability. So a little bit of anxiety is a good thing. If I get nervous before a talk, that's a good sign. Uh, if I don't get nervous before a lecture, then I think that's, that's a sign of danger. Um, I am an anxiety-free zone is the extreme. So if we take healthy self-evaluation and blow it into hyper-self-evaluation, stay away question number five coming up. Who could be on the next slide? Not a young man. Very good, yeah, yeah. No, it's not. Clue, it's not a young man. Who's on the next slide, do you think? Look at that. 
I am the most worthy. I succeed at everything I do. Everything, the world, Middle East politics, career is within my control. And I'm anxiety free because I'm so good. All right. And there we have it in a sense. That's the, that's the absolute extreme example of hyper self-evaluation or hyper, it's called core self-evaluation in the psychology literature. And this is the famous stable genius quote from President Trump. Um, just a caveat, a health warning about the example of Trump. Yeah, he's a great example of a hubrist, but he's a very complex pick, a complex individual and um, you know he's not just a hubrist there's an element of well any other ist you want to <laughs> throw in all right so let's use him as a caricature but it's is you know he's not he's not the best example in some ways right so that's self-evaluation hyper self-evaluation and again I draw you back to the idea of Icarus who had, in a sense, over self-evaluation. And it's in the Bible, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Book of Proverbs uh, 18, verse 16. And that's it. That's my idea of this um, unintended negative consequences. The key word in all of that, everybody, is invites. Because what I am not saying is that uh, inflated self-evaluations and confidence and ambition will result in hubris. All I am saying is that it, invite, it creates the conditions which invite unintended negative consequences. It may result in negative consequences, it may not, but it creates the conditions. This is why hubris is a conundrum. It is a real conundrum for us. But it's a conundrum that human beings have grappled with for two and a half millennia. And we're still grappling with it today. Uh, anyway, right, so uh, the, oh, the winner effect starred there is this thing around testosterone. So it's a biological phenomenon. And it's a young male thing, and it's this with the way in which uh, testosterone fuels confidence, fuels victory. But eventually, that uh, virtuous cycle becomes broken, and uh, winning doesn't continue. Anyway, there's a literature on the winner effect. Uh, the way that I put it together is, I call it a paradox. The pa so hubris is a paradox, and a paradox is where you have two opposing things kind of together. That normally there's a kind of they push each other away, but somehow they are brought together in the same space. So with hubris, the paradox is this uh, bringing together of excessive confidence and deficiency of confidence, or excessive ambition and deficiency of ambition. And those they, they're, they're polar opposites, but somehow they come together in the space of hubris. So this little diagram which uh, I think captures it for me, talks about, so strengths lead to success. Uh, but success allied with power breeds hubris, and hubris turns your strengths into a weakness. Uh, and that's the paradoxical relationship between, between those, those, those things. Um, when I did a talk about hubris, uh, to a group of execs, and I kind of did a similar thing to, to yourself, a smaller group than this, and we said, okay, well, hubris, it's conf confidence, ambition, pride, and they just looked at me kind of with furrowed brows, and they said, well, everything you've described are the things that we recruit for, <laughs> so it's, it's this whole paradox thing about the strengths that we look for in leaders or managers or any of us, really, can, can contain the seeds of our, our downfall. So this strength into weakness thing, here's some examples. So what, what the strength into weaknesses look like? So positive alignment. So Steve Jobs was a great example of positive alignment gone uh, into uh, overdrive. 
because he identified with Apple. He was Apple. He was overly positively aligned. It was all of, I am this organization. Steve Jobs was Apple. It's all about me. Sound judgment, excessive self-confidence. Just trust me, I just know. Um, there's nothing in any of that kind of sound judgment concept of what uh, is talked about in one of the books on the standout there that Academy Wales have produced around managing risk. And it's like this idea of negative capability. Uh, a negative capability was a term invented by the poet Keats, and he talked about being comfortable in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts, and not rushing, therefore, to premature closure. So it's this idea of managing uncertainty. One of the things that we kind of promote in business, I guess, is that we kind of, we rush, don't we? We rush to judgment, and we have to have a decision, and we have to have decisiveness, and we do not necessarily always embrace uncertainty. But by not embracing uncertainty, then we open up ourselves to the risk of, of hubris. Okay, so, weak restraints on leaders. So I'll, I'll give you a political example of this. Then the best example, I think, of uh, the effect of... Uh, Leader restraint is Margaret Thatcher. So, Prime Minister, 79 to 90, born 25, died in 2013. A very controversial figure. And she's a good illustration of what can happen to a leader who was effective, and I know it's a politically loaded term, but was effective in particular ways, once a restraint has been removed. So... Uh, Victory, so 1982, the Falklands War, victory by Thatcher. 1984, the defeat, and I put it in inverted commas, of the miners in the miners' strike. So huge successes in fact, the early days of Thatcher's premiership. Um, she had a deputy, though, and the deputy was William Whitelaw. Willie Whitelaw. Whitelaw became ill in 87 and resigned in 88. And what happened in 89? We had that. We had the poll tax and the poll tax riots in Trafalgar Square. And then we had uh, the party turning against her. It's a bigger picture than that. It's to do with political divisions in the Conservative Party that haven't gone away, hence where we are today. But nonetheless, and um, one of the famous things that she said about... Um, her relationship with William Whitelaw was, and I'm not going to say it exactly as, as she said it, but you know what it is. Uh, she said every prime minister needs a William. She didn't say William, she said something else. Uh, the shorter form of it. And it ended in tears. Uh, so there she is. Dennis Thatcher doesn't quite know what's going on there in the back of the cab. Uh, but she's in tears, devastated by the defeat at the hands of her own party. Um, I got this from the Telegraph in 2012, and I leave it to you. All right. So he didn't have one, and now look where we are. Anyway, moving on. Tour holder. So, the con so with the previous slide about confidence, I gave you the, uh, the concept of the paradox and hyper self-evaluation. Um, with this one, um, the idea is the idea of a tow holder. So Willie Whitelaw was Thatcher's tow holder. He helped to keep her hubris in um, check. But once he moved out of the, uh, the frame, her hubris became uh, uncontrollable. Some people even thought that she had mental health issues at the time because her behaviour became so extreme, uh, like the no, no, no thing with Jacques Delors on, the, on, on Europe, etc. So the idea of a toll holder, this idea of a toll holder, and it's somebody who can... And this relates to the theme of this conference, the idea of bravery. So you know we're talking about what skills does a manager need. Well, maybe one of the skills uh, is this idea that you can speak truth to power. Now, that's much more problematical than me simply saying it, but it is an act of bravery, isn't it? To speak truth to power. And um, a toeholder is in a position because of affection, loyalty, mutual respect between the leader and the toe holder to enable them to speak truth to power. Right, stay awake, question number seven. 
What have all of these individuals got in common? They no longer work in the White House. They've been through the revolving door of Trump's White House. So we've got Sean Spicer, the direct, James Comey, director of the CIA, Steve Bannon, etc. And none of them were able to hold the toe of the 45th president. Uh, he doesn't have a toe holder to help keep him in uh, check. One of the ideas that's uh, vital in the, in the idea of hubristic leadership, and it's, it's the very first word that you uttered to me uh, as an audience response, and it was followers. So I said, you know, what, what's leadership about? He said followers, but you said it in a kind of a, an upbeat way. Followers have a vital role to play in hubristic leadership and it's followers in a negative sense and it's followers isn't in the sense of their being complicit so that I think there are two types of complicit followers uh, there are people who are conformers and there are people who are colluders this is not just politics this is in everyday organizational life and what the conformers do well they can be two types of conformers Lost souls, people who are just seeking direction, so they, they conform. Bystanders, we kind of, we don't show any bravery. We passively stand by and let it all unfold before us. And then there are the colluders, so acolytes, people who actually share the same vision as the leader. And then there are opportunities who may not share the same vision, but... Uh, use it uh, as an opportunity to further their own ends. So that's a little typology or framework for, for follower types. Okay, I'm going to move on fairly quickly now to um, the task. Final idea then. So I gave you the idea of the paradox, this cycle of strengths into weaknesses, the, fire, the, the second big idea, I suppose, or the big framework, uh, or not big framework, just the framework to kind of get your head around this. Strengths into weaknesses, <coughs> paradox. And then this, this second one is this idea of the toxic triangle of hubristic leadership. And I think we are deluding ourselves if we think that the hazard of hubris can be solved simply by managing the leader. So if we get rid of the hubristic leader, then the problem is solved. I think, it's, I think it's much more complex than that. And I think the complexity comes about because uh, leadership, by definition, is relational. It's about the relationship between leaders and followers. And it's also situational. It's about the context in which the leadership is enacted. So hubristic leadership does lead to destructive outcomes, but there is a role for followers, the complicit followers, and there's a role for context. And then when we put those three things together, only by considering those three aspects of this toxic triangle can we understand the destructive outcome. An example, I'm not going to go into it in any great depth. In fact, I'm not going to go into it in any depth at all. I'm simply going to fire it up onto the screen like that. Kids Company, the collapse of Kids Company, hugely controversial um, with regards to the way that government dealt with it, hugely controversial with regards to the leadership of that organisation. So the context was child poverty and the alleviation of child poverty and maximising the opportunities for children in poverty in cities like London, Bristol, Liverpool. So there's a context there conducive to it. The company collapsed. Arguably, there were hubristic leaders at the hell in uh, Camilla Batmengeli and Alan Yentob, but then there were the, uh, the complicit followers Everybody from the Prime Minister uh, through to the pop group 
Coldplay, who gave them eight million. Um, so all I am saying is that in terms of uh, managing the hazard of hubristic leadership, it is not simply uh, a case of looking at the leader. There is the whole context to look into. OK. There's the report from the House of Commons uh, Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Enough of that. Right, so what to do about it? I suppose what we're trying to do is devise, if we can, something that we might call an anti-hubris toolkit. And the tools that are in the toolkit are the skills that managers like yourself need in order to counter this thing that we've uh, been talking about <coughs> called hubris. So uh, these are some of the things that, that I kind of uh, uh, came up with. Emotional intelligence, self-awareness, know thyself. So again, that's the Greeks. Know thyself, the oracle at Delphi. Moderation in all things, know thyself. Conversation skills, gritty listening. I love that phrase. And it's, uh, it came from the winter school. And I love it. And I, can't, I, I wish I could remember the person who came up with it. But she said this idea of fate, listening for faint listening for faint signals. Gritty listening. Really, you know, being attuned to what's being said. Uh, asking questions, using social media to pick up signals. You know what people say. So social media, again, the example of Trump and Facebook. But anyway, exercising, taking responsibility, speaking truth to power. Uh, so just to tell you what we've talked about. Um, it's a foot. So to standing back now. So big picture. Uh, stand back on the stage. So hubristic leadership, what is it? It's a new topic in leadership studies. As I have said, we've got charismatic leadership, transactional, transformational, adaptive, whatever you want, you name it, we've got it. Um, hubristic leadership is a new area of leadership studies. It's an area that is evolving as we speak, and you are part of its evolution uh, because you're engaging with, you know, academics like myself and helping me to make sense of it, which I'm immensely grateful for. Uh, it's caused by power success over self-evaluation, etc. Please bear in mind that I've given you kind of the tip of the iceberg. There are other factors at work characterised by those things. Uh, overconfidence, overambition, arrogance, contempt, recklessness. Unintended negative consequences. So it creates, it does not lead to negative consequences necessarily, but it creates the conditions for unintended negative consequences. Hubristic leaders invariably do not set out to be destructive. There are examples of that that we were discussing over there where a leader can be deliberately destructive, but it's, it's the exception, I think, rather than the rule. Fred Goodwin didn't set out to, you know, make RBS bomb. Um, and followers and managers, so this last point is about yourselves, really. Followers and managers are vital in the process because they can encourage or constrain a leader's hubris. One of the things, of course, that we kind of didn't really get into, but that was fine, and, you know, in a longer session we could, was about how to manage hubris in ourselves because it's not just senior leaders. We are all prone to it because we all have power and power gives us the ability to influence people and situations. So we are all potentially prone to hubris. Um, last saying about the Greeks. Hubris calls for nemesis, and that's nemesis, the goddess of retribution on the left. Uh, this is from a philosopher called Mary Midgley. And she said, hubris calls for nemesis. And in one form or another, it's going to get it, not as a punishment, from the outside, but as part of a pattern that's already started. So hubris, think, we can think of it in terms of the conditions are created, it's a pattern that unfolds over time. An interesting challenge that we have is that pattern perhaps can take on a life of its own and, you know, is it stoppable once it starts? And I won't mention Trump at this point, but I just did. Um, I've got a little web, we've got a little website called thehubrishub.com, which is the website address is there. If you want to uh, have a look at it, that would be, might, you might find some stuff in there. It's in development, so one of my jobs for the summer is to 
make it nicer. And then in terms of further reading, shameless plug coming up. Uh, I've written a book, which is with the publishers at the moment. It's coming out in 28th, uh, later this year. Uh, but rather than reading the book, uh, this article that's coming out next year by myself and my three colleagues at the Hubris Project at the university. If you read that article, this one here, you'll know as much about it as I do. Uh, it's not out yet, but if you want a copy of it, uh, I'll be utterly delighted to uh, send it to you. It's not like me to finish early. I love this clock. It's like, uh, it's like being at a parliamentary select committee, isn't it? Where you have to stop... Um, we've got three seconds left. Any questions? <laughs> All right, done. I'm in minus now. So anyway, over. thank you very much. I'm done. Happy to stick around and talk. <laughs>